Guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 193, featuring the third slice of my interview with Mr. Neil Hawford, the storytelling genius behind Betrayal at Crondor, one of my favorite computer role-playing games. In this part of the interview, we talk about the fall of Cave Dog Entertainment, the company founded by Ron Gilbert that unfortunately bit off a little more than it could chew. We also talk about Neil's book, Swords and, Circus uh, Swords and Circuitry, a classic how-to guide for anyone aspiring to do a computer role-playing game. Uh, he's got a lot of interesting insights to share with us about that book. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Neil Halford. I'm looking forward to that, so. Now, what can you tell me about this game, uh, Elysium? Elysium. Elysium, is it with a Z, Elysium? Elysium, Elysium. Um, um, there is wow, you're digging digging up old wounds, aren't you? Um, um, Elysium was there. There, there, there say that are cutting edge, and then Elysium existed in that universe that we call the bleeding edge. Uh, part of Cave Dog, um, uh, um, and. The concept for for it was that we want to do a role playing game, uh, but we want to kind of challenge a lot of things that people are used to. Is number one is have a a role playing game first of all that takes partially in a fantasy esque you know Tolkien esque you know kind of universe, but half of it takes place in the real world. Um, and um, also sort of in between. And I was very fascinated in the idea of uh, dreams and dream worlds and, and things of this nature. And so uh, that was the, the base concept behind Elysium is the fact that whenever you go to sleep, um, that uh, while you sleep, you actually inhabit this other universe and it has its own history and it has its own timelines. It has all this other kind of stuff that goes on. Um, so, uh, I just love this idea that um, uh, our, our concept was is that every single monster that you kind of know of that you've ever heard of is kind of a reflection of an, of an archetype that exists in this other universe in Elysium. And um, uh, so a lot of things that made the game very different is number one, um, it was also going to be, like I said, so it was, uh, we, we had this idea of of playing in the real world for an RPG, which was very weird. You didn't do that back in 97. Um, and the other thing too was um, the game was going to be episodic and nobody was doing episodic content back then. Um, and so uh, the idea was is that you would have episodes that you would play of the show and it would even go so far is that every episode would you know John and I were both big fans of X Files. It was hugely influenced by the X Files, um, and I said that we really love the fact that every episode of the X Files had its own feel to them. Some of them would just be really kind of like gothic or really really scary kind of stuff. Some stuff would feel more like political thriller, and then you'd have one that was like funny. It was just like goofy comedy kind of stuff. And I love the fact that all of that stuff existed under this big umbrella. That was the Xbox. And we said, we really like that idea. And they said, we'd like to, have the, to kind of create the idea is that you would have different episodes that you could play. Uh, and also the, the thing that was interesting was that, say you said, you know what? I could play episode one and I could play episode three without ever playing, playing episode two. You know, so that I could, I could I kind of pick and choose. I could play them out of order because they weren't really intended to be this big you know, if you played all of them, you would get kind of a sense of the conspiracy, the the whatever the mythology was. But you could play them in, individually, and they were truly episodic in as much as they didn't have a lot of, well, you can only do this because this happened at level before. They were kind of self-contained. Um, it was a weird title. I mean, it was really, really weird and very kind of groundbreaking. And um, the the problem that we had with it uh, is is that, number one, we were fighting this really big assumption is, will anybody ever buy something they don't have a box for? Because the prevailing thought of the time was, it is so ingrained in us that I have to have, an, have a box. I mean, I, I spend money, I go out, I got to take something off, off a shelf. Uh, gamers will never, ever depart from that, that play mechanism. You know, or is that they're going to have 
that box and the collectible and the map and the and all of the stuff that goes in the box they will never ever stop doing and this is of course before itunes ever sold their first you know uh song and of course we all know now uh that that whole thing blew out the window and little did we realize that not only will they be buying things completely digitally that the hard you know the the, the days of games being in boxes is numbered uh and there's going to become a time whenever the only time you get something in a box it's going to be an exclusive edition you know that this is not the way most people buy their games i go click it i download it i play it and uh and all that kind of stuff. And so that scared the heck out of them because there were so many ramifications because the market says, how do I sell this? You know, uh, because, and how many people in the country even have an internet connection fast enough they can download this content? How will they buy it? You know, have a store, will it be part of something else? How's this gonna happen? Um, and the, the, it scared the, the, the heebie-jeebies out of the management of that company. I will give credit, however, to 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 uh, you know Ron Gilbert, who of course was the head of the company, you know, uh, father of Monkey Island and all that other wonder stuff. The fact that he let us play for as long as he let us play in that particular you know environment, and but you know Cave Dog, uh, it had uh, it had a problem, a growth problem, and I, I I still maintain to this day is Cave Dog is one of the best game companies that ever existed. They had so many of the first tier, amazing, incredible designers under their roof. Uh, and it is one of the living tragedies to this day that it didn't make it uh, long term. And partially, I think it's just because they were very successful with TA, you know, with Total Annihilation. And I think they just said, OK, well, we were very successful with Total Annihilation, uh, Total Annihilation. So they went from a one product company to a five product company by the next year and so you know fought so from one team to five one of which was working on a sequel to ta um and so elysium was part of that and the awakening um okay i get these mixed up there's black and white and then there's, there's the other one good and evil one was ron's <laughs> uh, um um and so um uh, then there was another title, and I'm kind of drawing a blank on what was there. Uh, but uh, Elysium was part of that, and they, whenever they've started realizing we're too big, we're we're not going to be able to deliver all five of these titles, uh, and they were saying, well, where are we going to cut? And they said, well, okay, the axe fell on Elysium, and of course I was outraged and upset about the whole thing at the time because i mean it was my baby i spent a long time in development on that particular title and i really felt like we broke a lot of ground with it uh but we were probably about five or six years ahead of our time you know um if we had been developing it you know uh you know that around 2000 i think it would have been a very different animal i think we actually would have gotten out the door and uh, the amazing thing about it is we got some of the most incredible pre-buzz. The, the number of articles that got wrote about us said, this is going to be one of those all time-altering space. The games will never be the same, blah, 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 blah. And so, which is great stuff to hear. Um, but you just like going, I, I go, here's this fabulous game that you're never going to see. Uh, um, um, but um, the nice thing about it was, is that a lot of, whenever everything was starting to fall apart and Ron contacted me about the whole situation and he said you know uh we were talking to john and i both and and said you know very sorry about what happened with uh, with lizzie or whatever uh please know it's just not a, it's not really a case of not having a belief in this product or or what have you uh but the financials aren't there and we have to to let this team go and of course uh i um uh, i when i was talking to ron about everything the one thing he said is I could keep the rights to, to write stories set in the Elysium universe, or write movies and write books. I couldn't do anything of the games because the tech belonged to Cave Dog. So one of these days, who knows, maybe I'll actually take the, all the stuff I did for that and create a book or write a movie or do something else with that uh, stuff. But that was very generous of Ron to basically allow me to keep the, the rights for that stuff. Uh, because I, I kind of brought it in. 
I was you know, I, I have this unique way that I work for for a lot of game companies, and as much as uh, I often work as an independent contractor, and so a lot of times I bring this stuff in the door, and so it's like my IP when I walk in the door, and so it stays with me when I leave. Um, and some companies uh, are very cool about kind of allowing me to kind of keep stuff, so that's awesome. Um, so so he allowed me to kind of hold on to that. Um, then I worked for a little while on Amen the Awakening uh, with Greg McMartin. Um, uh, then unfortunately that one got canceled. <laughs> I said, okay, don't touch anything else. And you'll just stay away from all the other projects, you know. But uh, of course, as we all know, the rest of the story is uh, Cave Dog had kind of a slow collapse uh, over the course of about a year. Uh, it's just canceling project, cancel, cancel, cancel. Um, and I, I think just the biggest lesson was there is it wasn't that they had bad titles. It, it wasn't that they had bad people. They just bit off more than they can chew. Uh, in terms of they had one successful title, I think, you know, in, in it's one of those things. I have 20, 20, you know, hindsight say that, you know, the right thing would have done would have been, okay, build a sequel to TA and one other title and then build some kind of sensibly um, as, as opposed to this sort of crazy, you know, rapid explosive growth that they had. Um, but as again, as I said, it's, it's just a shame because they had such incredible talent there. I, I, uh, every one of those guys who was working all those different projects, I mean, all of them were tier one ace designers uh, and programmers and people, in my opinion. Uh, and I, I was lucky that I ever got to play in that playground. <laughs> okay, so around 2002, right, is when you wrote uh, Swords and Circuitry, a designer's guide to computer role-playing games. Kind of wondering what inspired you to write this book and uh, what, I guess, has, has it been updated uh, since uh, 2002? Um, so actually we, we wrote it in, uh, 2000, um, okay. we were writing, it, it was, it was kind of funny because, uh, the summer that, that happened was kind of funny is that I was out of work. I didn't have any gigs going on and I was kind of in a panic. And so I just decided that, um, I, I, was, I had an idea for a while that I was going to write a book about of creating uh, computer games because again there was there was no school I went to for game design they that whole concept didn't exist back then uh, and so I said okay I looked around there were some other books that were about writing for the computer gaming industry but none of them were I'll, I'll be honest none of them were particularly great books on on game design uh, and most of them were were like writing scripts and everything else I said they didn't really talk much about how games are actually made. Um, and so, so I said, I, there's, there's a, definitely a need for this. And so I, I wrote up the proposal, uh, for, uh, for it and I sent it in to Prima, uh, cause I, I heard that they were sending out a, a request for, for new titles and, and if you're looking for, for stuff. And so I sent it into Prima. I honestly didn't expect for them to kind of call me because I just figured that, well, I didn't have any experience writing textbooks or, or this other stuff. So they probably wouldn't come and grab a hold of me. And again, because I'm not like, you know, I'm not one of these superstar, you know, names that people heard of. I, people have heard my name. They've heard, they've heard more of the things I've worked on than anything else. And so I didn't figure that, that people would pay much attention to me. So lo and behold, uh, at the same time, I'd been talking to Chris and he said, yeah, I've got this new role playing game that I'm working on and uh, I might need you to come in and help me do the story for it. We've got a lot of the tech done for it. Uh, and I've got a kind of a basic idea of what I want for it, but I need you to come in and, and do it. So both of these things were kind of these nebulous things, and I didn't really think they were going to happen. And then lo and behold, almost at the same time, I got the book proposal was bought, and Chris needed me to come in to write Dungeon Siege. Uh, and so I was like, okay, this is going to be a busy year. Um, and so um, um, so the, the book was, uh, again, the book was, the book I wish I had been handed the day I started at New World Computing. And that just explained to me, this is how it works. This is uh, uh, this will kind of help you uh, go through this process, so you understand that that, that um, this isn't completely random and chaotic. That there's a, there's a, a rhyme and a reason to, to the way things uh, work, and you don't have to live in complete darkness. Um, um, and uh, again, I really that's uh, I, I've actually been very very pleased with people's comments about swords and circuitry over the years i had several people who worked in the industry say hey you know i read your book this is fantastic stuff uh 
And um, um, it's funny because I, the book publisher really didn't know that well how to deal with it because the rest of their titles were programming books. Here's a chunk of code. Here's a chunk of code, blah, 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 blah. And um, whenever I was talking to them about my book, I said, now just understand is that we're talking about game design and game design is a lot fuzzier than coding books. It's not like here is a formula, follow this formula. Every time you do this, this will be successful. Uh, and I said, this is gonna seem almost like here is a humanities book uh, because we're gonna jump across talking about sociology, why people buy things, you know, uh, building worlds from scratch, you know, and, and the historical uh, perspective. Here's here's the history of computer of role playing games. You know, all this incredible stuff that I said I'm going to put all this stuff in the one book, just so that you honestly feel, feel like I went to college and I here's here's my results from that. And so, and here's how, here's which how you you format a, a game design proposal. Here is you know all all the basic stuff that I wish that somebody sat me down and said just do this, just do this. Um, and so anyway, that was sort of my response to that is it was just the book that I wish I'd had, uh, whenever I got started. And the coolest thing I remember happening because of that book was, um, one time I was being asked to appear and do a, uh, do a lecture here in San Diego for the International Game Developers Association, the, the chapter chapters here in town. And, um, so, um. Oh, actually, no, no, we, we weren't, uh, we, I've done lectures there before, but we weren't there for a lecture. We were there for somebody else's event. And we were talking to this young guy. He was 22, 23 years old. And uh, so we we're going along and, and kind of chatting very generally about things. And then he asked us what our name was. And I said, well, hi, I'm, I'm, well, I'm Neil Halford. And this is my wife, Jana. And he said, you're who? And I said, I'm Neil Halford. And this is my wife, Jana. And he reaches into his book bag. And he pulls out swords and circuitry. He says, these people? And I said, yes, that's, oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's our, our book or whatever. He says, I carry this with me all the time. I, it's never away from me. He said, this is the book. It's like the Bible to me, you know, and that everything I, I know or understand about game design, I got out of your book. It's incredible. I read it over and over all the time. Um, and it was just like, holy crap. You know, you, this kid, this kid carries it with him at all times, 24 seven. And just, he just happens to have it whenever we run into him. And since that time, I've actually had other people tell me exactly the same thing is that there was this hugely influential thing on them. It was incredible. It was fantastic. And uh, that's great to hear. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it inspired people and that it helped them kind of on their, their way. And then they feel like they got something fantastic out of it. And so I put a lot of, of, of passion into it. Uh, but also my wife, uh, she actually wrote the history on the, the history of games for us. Uh, some of the chapters of marketing, she, she wrote the sections on the marketing uh, about it. Um, so um, anyway, I'm, I've just been very, very grateful that, that people responded to it well. Um, in terms of whether it's been updated, uh the, the book publisher we always kind of felt like put us on a back burner you know they didn't really promote us as hard as they did the other titles because they honestly just didn't know what to do with us because again they couldn't they couldn't just say just here follow this piece of code and you, you know plug this piece of code in and it works or whatever they really didn't know what to do with it we got you know very very solid reviews from the people whenever it got reviewed when I'm on amazon you'll see we've got really great reviews from people on there about it uh, but they just never understood our title. Um, uh, though they, um, uh, I had very wonderful editors associated. And I want to give huge shout outs to, to Amy, who was one of our, our editors, and uh, another gentleman. I feel terrible on forgetting his name right now, but he was extra extraordinarily patient with us, with us in developing the book. But he got it. And I, that was the one of the things that I felt was, was great for us is because he understood what we were trying to do with the book. Uh, the only thing that really upset me about the book was that um, I told them that I really wanted to do something special with the title uh, where I wanted to have it designed, the interior design of it to be done almost like you're reading a Dungeons and Dragons manual with these really cool insets and, and all this other cool stuff. And they didn't understand that at all. We'd sent them all this fantasy art, which they then stuck in plates in the middle of the book. And people who read the book go, what the hell is that all about? 
Uh, <laughs> um, um, and it was because of what we discussed before. You were supposed to like do you do it? Well, yeah, we just have this kind of template, and and we just kind of make them all the same. I said, so we have all this random fantasy art in the middle of the book for no reason whatsoever. It makes no sense. Um, but um, uh, of course the um, uh, the the logo that got done for for swords and circuitry, of course, stuck with us over the years. And of course, later uh, later on, when we decided that we wanted to have a formal title for for the company, swords and circuitry stuck because it's a name that everybody knows us by. And so, don't don't if it's not, something work it works, don't break it. Uh, so so uh, that logo, of course, I've embellished it quite a bit over over the years, and it's it's a lot fancier, fancier than than what we had. But it was a wonderful illustration done by our friend uh, Jim Weibel. Um, and, uh, uh, but yeah, so, uh, other additions, um, we are kind of chatting about whether we want to do another edition. Uh, there probably will never be another paper edition of it, uh, because honestly, if you go to your local bookstore and you go look at technical manuals, they're a dying breed. You're, you're just not going to find them because it's like, as fast as they're print, you print them, they're obsolete. And so I'm... I'm heavily considering a heavily updated, revised uh, Swords and Circuitry too. Uh, and the thing about it was, is I don't know how much of a revision it would be. I, it almost truly would have to be a sequel because so much has changed since we published uh, the first volume. Uh, because um, just because the book is only the, the book is only very cautiously starting to talk about multiplayer in a very general sort of way. We've had since had WoW and all this other stuff kind of explode out there, and we've had the the world of multi you know uh, multiplayer modules, and we've got all of this crazy you know in game content. This stuff, none of the stuff that existed back in the day, and I don't think you could really write a reasonable book about the stuff without addressing that in a major way. And so um, uh, we are talking about it. I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, whether I'm going to have time to do it because the original book was 530 some odd pages, uh, I could see the sequel tipping out at about 800. Uh, um, and um, because the one thing I want to do is I would like to preserve a lot of the classic interviews that we had in the first one. You know, we're not going to get rid of the interview with JVC. We're not going to get rid of Chris Taylor's original. You know, uh, I think Chris Taylor's interview about Dungeon Siege in that book is actually. If you want to be a game designer, that's one of the most critical things I've ever read because Chris actually, Chris's philosophy of game design is actually fairly similar to mine. And uh, he, he, the way he, he kind of explain, explains his process and some other stuff, there's some great stuff in his interview there. Uh, John Cutter, who I like to say, who's my personal mentor. Um, so there's all those interviews that are in there and great perspective on sort of how lots of these games kind of developed uh and some of the stuff hasn't changed there's some basic stuff that's that, that's uh there but uh it's not a small undertaking that that revision would in all in effect really be an almost an entirely new book uh and we want to do it um but uh, it would probably entirely be an ebook because uh, I, I just don't know that who wants to carry around an 800 page you know uh, tome on game design what are some of your uh favorite uh, lessons, or I almost want to say parables or verses from the book that uh, you see in modern games, you need to think, man, I wish they would just read this part of Swords and Circuitry. Mm. God. Um, that's really hard to say. Um, I think uh, one of the first chapters that we actually had um, in the book is actually talking about putting on your hat and thinking about the player. And here are different sort of types of players. And well, there are actually some new archetypes that didn't exist in, in the book because they are actually uh, a function of social gaming, the way that, that the social aspect of, of, of computer gaming, which just didn't exist, you know, back in the day, not in the way it exists now, um, guilds and all this other stuff. But um, that first session just talks about the, really the importance of remembering that at the end of the day there's a player that's going to play this game and it's really about what they want and it's, it's, it's interesting now is because there is more interest in, in paying attention to feedback from players uh, because whenever uh, I was developing games back in you know before 2000 we were making product you know I make a product and then we marketing figures out people to sell it to you know, and that was the model for the way games got developed back in the day. And 
that's not really the way that we make games anymore. And I'm not necessarily saying that either is necessarily a superior model to the other, but things have changed. If you're going to move to that new model of, of, um, of basically looking at games as a service rather than a product, and so basically we're doing this in service to you. You, I, you know, I want you to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, I'm making a game that 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 plays to that. You need to understand who those player types, what they, what there is, what they're attracted to, what they're turned away from, and really decide who you're making a game for. Because the hard thing about it is, and and you see people that are trying to make these games that appeal to everybody. I want you know to, us to have 300 billion players that play this game, and I say. Yeah, well, you might be able to come up with a game called with 300 billion players. It's called Farmville. Um, and, you know, uh, I'll knock my good friends at Zynga. They have lots of money, and, and no one can argue that they are extremely successful at making whatever it is those games are or things are. I don't really consider them games because I'm an old school gamer, and gamer means beginning, middle, end. Uh, um, there is a goal. There is a, and, there's something that I, you know, of course you say, well, there, there's a goal that I set myself. I'm going to set up my farm and I'll have a beautiful windmill. And just, oh, damn. So, yes, okay, I've just lost myself any kind of job in social media again. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, but anyway, so, un but the, the end of the day is always remember at the end of the day that even though you've gotten this business and I have this fantastic vision, this thing that I want to sell, I, I want to, to make this incredible world. Um, just remember at some, some point, there's going to be some poor kid that's going to sit down and turn on this game. And he has to understand what the hell you were trying to do, you know, and how it works. And is he going to have to sit down and read a manual for five hours to get it? And if so, you failed. You failed miserably, you know, is, is the fact that you need to be able to communicate what's going on through the gameplay, uh, through uh, the interface needs to be clear, and just understand that, that at the end of the day, is, is uh, it's about the player and what they, they want to do. Now, I don't, I'm not saying you need to sell your soul. You shouldn't make a game that you would never play, uh, because uh, at, at, I, I don't personally have any, any desire to go... Uh, go make a, make a whole horde of games that, that I would never play because honestly I'm going to have no passion for it and if I had no passion for it you're going to feel it I, I believe that completely and solidly a person's passion for whatever they're doing you will feel it come through the material whatever it is uh, and if they don't have it and they don't care about it you know then you know they're going to gloss over unimportant or they're going to gloss over important details they're going to cut corners when they shouldn't cut corners uh, and I, I feel firmly and resolutely that you shouldn't be making stuff if you don't feel it down in the core of your bones. And that's hard because, uh, you know, you don't always have the choice, particularly if you if you work in this game for, uh, for a living, unless you're self-employed, you know, you don't get to make choices about what, what you make. And so sometimes you unfortunately do end up being stuck on, yeah, I'm making a golf game because I need to make a living. And you have a roof over my head and eating all that good stuff. And it's hard particularly now. Uh, I mean, we are unquestionably in the most terrifying market I've ever seen in my life uh, in working in the games industry. I remember a lot of the difficulties we had back in the early 80s, I mean, before I got into the industry, but just, you know, seeing what's going on with companies and kind of you know, in retrospect, but, you know, this not even remotely close to what, what we have now. We've seen in the past three years, I've, I've watched so many solid, stable, reputable companies full of incredible, amazing people go down. And it, it, for years, it was the the fact that that the game industry is bulletproof. Oh well, you know, the economy is bad, but it doesn't matter. Games continue to grow; it's fantastic. And everyone kind of believed that was always going to be true. And I think that's one of the biggest shocks to this the system right now is we thought that, that was honestly a reality that we're bulletproof and don't worry about it. The economy tanks, games will continue to do fantastically well. Um, and, and it's really hard. I mean, it, it's, it pains me to see my friends lose their jobs, to see basically great titles go down because, well, it's too risky. You know, it's not, it's not enough like the 50 other, you know, best-selling games of last year. We can't afford to really go down that path because we don't know what lies down there. And considering that all of our jobs are on the line, um, I understand that where, where the, the financial people come from. 
um, but it's it's bad for gaming. Um, and so um, I, I just really hope that all my friends get ride through all of this and then they get out safely on the other side. So. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a fourth installment of this interview with Mr. Neil Halford. A lot of great stuff coming up, including his work on Dungeon Siege and much, much more. So stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you guys very, very much if you have supported this show. It really means a lot to me, guys. It's keeping these episodes in production. So if you'd like to support the show, you can go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link. And remember, you can make a one-time donation, or you can set up a monthly subscription, even a dollar a month. Uh, will go a long ways towards keeping these shows coming. So thank you very, very much, guys. Also, uh, I still have some copies left of uh, Honoring the Code, Conversations with Great Game Designers. This is the, a book that just came out maybe a month or so ago. It has uh, transcriptions of a lot of my favorite interviews from the show, including a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the episodes is in here. Uh, if you'd like to get this, you can get it from Amazon. If you want a signed copy, uh, you can uh, give me $40 on top of uh, whatever uh, the shipping cost will be for you, uh, wherever you are. Uh, we can work that out over email. So if you're interested in getting a signed copy, uh, just you can use the contact button at Armchair Arcade or talk to me here on YouTube, however you want to do it. I just get in touch, guys, because I'd really like for you to have one of these. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got a the second of these uh, flavors from Whole Hog. I think the name of this company is actually hidden somewhere here. Stevens Point <laughs> Brewery. They could do a little better job of, of their labeling. Stevens Point, uh, Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Remember I had last episode, I had the uh, IPA. So this is the Russian Imperial Stout. I haven't had a lot of Russian Imperial Stouts, but I like the their uh, IPA so much, I decided I definitely wanted to give this a try. Looking for any kind of information about it, uh, there's a little flavor, literal, literally flavor text here, cluster, cascade, hops, uh, handcrafted, yada yada. Whoa! <laughs> I just noticed the alcohol percent, 8.6%. Uh, so this is a very serious uh, Russian Imperial Stout. I don't usually see uh, ales that strong, um, although I guess some of them do go up well over 10%, and some of those I had from, <laughs> from Herb, I think, were... Uh, 40% I think on one of those. But anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Russian Imperial Stout here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Gotta say, I'm feeling more manly already. <sighs> Smelling this, it's, uh... You can definitely smell a sort of a cherry... That's more... What's probably the most pronounced uh, aroma here is kind of a... Cherry, coffee, chocolatey uh, type of thing. Uh, smells quite nice. Well, let's give it a taste. Now that is definitely a bold uh, flavor there. It's just a little bitter. It's kind of uh, they got sort of that cherry sweet, like a like a cherry cough syrup um, kind of a. If you can imagine cherry flavored cough syrup mixed with some uh, really dark coffee. Now that's kind of what I'm tasting here. Uh, definitely not something you would want to chug. It's a it's an interesting and, and complex flavor though. Uh, I'm trying to think what else I'm tasting there. Uh, maybe sort of a smoky smokiness, sort of peaty like a flavor going on there too. It's uh, not something that I would want to drink by the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> by, uh, by any means, but it's not bad. It's definitely different. I'm gonna go uh, three out of five drinking horns on this. I, I have to say I prefer their IPA to this, but uh, this isn't bad. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I found a good quotation from one of Neil's favorite authors, uh, Mr. Glenn Cook. It goes something like this. My favorite sport is female, and my favorite food is beer. See you guys next week. Yeah, you're too busy picking up the vomit. Well, you're doing it now. Why, why am I walking around with a rat I head? think you've got, put them in your top pocket there. I think you've you got a little attached to that rat. Some of your best friends are rats. <laughs> I work in television. All my friends are rats. <laughs> <laughs>